invite you to bow your heads with me as we seek God's blessing. Father, you have given us an amazing gift in Jesus. And we ask that we might see him more clearly today is our prayer in Christ's name. Amen. How many of you like receiving gifts? Okay, most everybody here. How many of you like giving them a lot more than receiving them? <laughs> yeah, quite a few of you. You enjoy that experience of being able to bless someone else of giving a gift and... That's, uh, that's definitely in line with God's heart. Uh, I enjoy both, and I enjoy receiving gifts, but I have discovered that there's something very interesting about gifts. Gifts can be one of those things that is either the most enjoyable and heartfelt experiences that bring so much joy into your heart, right? Or it can be what's the string attached, right? So the big question you often want to ask with a gift is, why? What's on the other end of that? Because if you know that that's coming from a place of heartfelt appreciation towards you, a place of love towards you, oh, it makes that gift even more valuable than whatever the value of the gift is. It just fills you up. And yet there are times when we receive gifts and there is just this feeling inside of us that there is some ulterior motive behind that gift, right? It's like they're giving you something now so that when they come back and ask for a favor later, you're kind of going to feel obligated to help, right? Those gifts just aren't as fun to receive, are they? It makes a big difference if you know the why, behind the gift as to how you experience it. So today, uh, in this season that we have been in, we're looking at the idea of Advent, the time of coming, if you will, of God to earth. That's what that word means. We looked at that a couple of Sabbaths ago. The time when God comes to earth, and in this particular uh, word of Advent, we have the idea of God coming to earth as a baby, of being born into this world. And it's a time that we celebrate and we love this season, we sing these carols. But if you were at the very beginning of all of this, the question that would have been asked is, why? Why is God here? Why is He showing up? What's going on? And it's a valid question for us to ask as well, even standing on this side of that amazing event. What is God up to? Is God simply showing up to check up on us to see how bad we're doing? Did He come with a clipboard to basically say, oh, nope, you're not doing well here, 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 and here? Did He come for those kinds of reasons or was there a very different reason why Jesus came to earth. If Jesus' birth is a gift for the human race, we want to understand the why so that that impacts us on a whole different level. So we're going to look at that today. We're going to look at that. And in order to help us answer some of these questions of why, we're going to start in a very familiar place if you know the story around the Advent season. This is taken from Luke chapter 2. Luke tells us that at that time of the year, there were shepherds out with their flocks at night. They've been out with their flocks. That's what they did. They were shepherds, and it was now nighttime which leads us to believe that it was probably not December, but most likely sometime in the fall of the year. A uh, little too cold in December for the shepherds to just be out with their flocks in the fields like this at night. But the, the shepherds are out with their flocks, and they are talking to each other. 
shepherd conversations. Now, I have not been uh, a keeper of sheep as they are, so I can only imagine what the conversations are like, but one of the things that I have read about in Scripture and that I have heard from other people is that sheep have a tendency to wander off at times. They have a tendency to just kind of follow the one in front of them, and they don't even know where they're going. They're just following this one, wherever that may lead them. And so shepherds, of course, are probably going to be talking about the kinds of things that happen as uh, they live this life as a shepherd. The times when they have to help give the, the, the you give birth to that little lamb and maybe sometimes to really work on that little lamb to help it survive. The, the experience of being out in the elements as they are. But at some point, the conversation most likely turns to the thing that they are longing for. Because when you have been a part of a people that have been occupied by controlling forces for so long, and it's been oppressive, the thing that you long for is a Savior. You long for this being to come whose name is Messiah. And so the conversation most likely begins to turn back to this all-encompassing theme of when. When are we going to be saved? And it's into this night and into this story and this conversation that all of a sudden something happens that I don't think any of us here have ever experienced. An angel shows up. Not kind of one of those nice little cupids with the bow and arrow that we all kind of smile about on Valentine's Day, but a real life angel from heaven. The kind that make you just like go to the floor because the brightness and the glory is so strong and so big. And the shepherds have never seen anything like this before. And they are startled as you can imagine, because whenever an angel shows up in Scripture, people are completely startled, and there's usually a phrase that the angel has to say, and he says it on this occasion. But I can only imagine just how much it must have taken for the angel to wait, because he was coming with a message, a message that he wanted them to hear, and he was super excited about it. But he had to deal with their fears first. And so Luke chapter 2, verse 10, is where we pick up the story uh, from the text. The angel said to them four words, do not be afraid. <laughs> and I guess if I was one of the shepherds, if I could even talk, I guess the thing I would say is, it's easy for you to say, right? You're used to this, we're not. We're a little afraid right now because we've never experienced anything like this and you are extremely bright. But sometimes also angels are messengers and so you're wondering what kind of a message is it that the angel's going to communicate? Have we really messed up that bad that he's coming to let us know? And so the angel says, do, do not be afraid. And now he's going to tell them why. I bring you, what are the words on the screen, the next two words? Good news. This is the word in the Greek, evangelion. This is, it's actually a slightly different form in this, uh, in this usage. But it's from, it's, it's the word that we get gospel from. This is the word for gospel in the New Testament. And the gospel is meant to be good news. And so the angel comes with the gospel, if you will. He comes with good news. Right at the beginning, he wants them to know that this message he's going to communicate is good news. He goes on that will cause great joy for all. The people. It's a message of good news that's going to bring great joy to all the people. And he's just been waiting, pent up, waiting for this moment to be able to communicate it. 
And he communicates it first and foremost to a group of men out in the fields that most people don't give two cents for. He goes on, today in the town of David, a Savior has been born to you. Not simply that a Savior has been born, but a Savior has been born to you. This is God coming to be with you in human form, in human flesh. He is the Messiah, the Lord. The very one that you have been waiting for and longing for has been born and He's here right now. This will be the sign to you, the angel says. You will find a baby wrapped in cloths and surprise, surprise, lying in a manger. That's a feeding trough in case we want to glamorize it. That's actually what it is. It's a feeding trough for animals. This Savior, this Messiah that has been born is in a stable and He's sleeping in a feeding trough wrapped up in some cloth. The rest of the angels who have been waiting for this moment, they can't wait any longer. And so Luke records in verse 13, Suddenly a great company of the heavenly host appeared with the angel, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest heaven and on earth, peace to those on whom His favor rests. What a message the angels came to give. So the idea of this gift, this amazing gift that God has given to the human race, that the shepherds were informed about on that night so long ago, wrapped up in this gift, wrapped up is this baby who is meant to be good news who is meant to inspire joy and bring peace and the reality that God, His favor, rests on the human race. The favor of God is upon them. That means God is for you. He is not against you. Now, there may be times when God might be against some of the things that we do, but boy, brothers and sisters, remember, God is for you. He came for you and me. And then these words, Luke chapter 19 and verse 10, that kind of bring this story together, that help us understand this idea of a baby wrapped up in claws, why he came. This is the central text, if you will, in the Gospel of Luke. This is the text that pretty well defines the ministry of Jesus, this God who became a baby and grew up in this world to save it. This is the text that sums up His ministry in the Gospel of Luke better than any other. If there was one thing that you could pull from the Gospel of Luke, it would probably be this is the most important. Jesus says these words, For the Son of Man, speaking of Himself, came to seek and to save the lost. So let's think about this for a moment. The Son of Man did what? He came. Now, that seems like a fairly straightforward thing. I mean, you can say, my neighbor next door came over to the house yesterday. And it simply means that someone went from one place to another. It can also mean that my relative from another continent got on a ship to be able to get to another city and took a bus to an airport and then flew to three different airports before they finally got to my continent and then took another airplane to get to my city and before I picked them up in the airport. They came a really long ways with a lot of effort to come and see me. 
right? When we think about the idea of the Son of Man or Jesus coming to this earth, it's not just coming from next door, right? He didn't just pop over from next door to say hi and give us a bag of food, as awesome as that is when your neighbor does that, or maybe some cookies. He came from heaven. He made the long-distance trip, if you will, from heaven at the right hand of His Father, divesting Himself of all of His external glory to allow Himself to become an embryo in Mary's womb. To allow Himself to be pushed through a birth canal into this cold, hard, dark world. Jesus came, and it was a long distance that He traveled. And He left a lot behind for this trip. The text says that the Son of Man came to seek This starts to clue us in on why He came. He came on a mission. Now sometimes when people are seeking you, the thing you want to do is run, right? Because sometimes they're after you. Sometimes they want something from you. They are looking for you in ways that you want nothing to do with. But whatever the case is, When a person is seeking you, they are putting forth energy and effort to find you. They are looking for you. They are seeking you. The text tells us that Jesus came this long distance to search, to seek for people. And he came this long distance searching for people not to point a finger, not with his checklist, even though he could have brought one because, man, the earth is messed up and it wasn't much better in Jesus' day, maybe worse. But he didn't come with the checklist. He didn't come seeking to just point out all the wrong things about us. He came searching Or seeking to do what? To save. That's why He came. To save. And then He tells us what kind of people need saving. People who are lost. The Son of Man came to seek and to save The lost, those who are in trouble and need saving. Those who are not able to find their way back home on their own. Which, by the way, is all of us. It's all of us. Jesus says these words in a context of a little guy named Zacchaeus. Zacchaeus is a chief tax collector and he's climbed up in a tree outside of Jericho because he's heard about this Jesus character and he wants to see him. Now Zacchaeus is one of those people that everyone would say is a lost cause. He's the kind of person that nobody except the kind of people that do his line of business would even dare to be around. He is a lost person according to everyone in his area. And everyone within his culture. Zacchaeus is lost. He is out on the margins. He's the kind of person nobody wants to be around. And it's interesting that the very kinds of people in the Gospel of Luke that Jesus searches for, that he seeks after, are the kinds of people that everybody else feels are lost. Jesus is embodying through his life the message that he says in Luke chapter 19, verse 10, that I came to seek and to save lost people. 
And Zacchaeus is one of those characters. And the beautiful thing about this story, Zacchaeus gets found on that day. And it shocks people. Because not only could Zacchaeus not find his way home to his father's house on his own, he needed someone to seek after him. Zacchaeus was one of those people that everybody felt was morally lost. So far so that there was nothing to be done for him. Just leave him be. And Jesus comes searching for him. Looks up in that tree and says, Zacchaeus, come down. I'm going to your house today as a sign of friendship. Because I came to seek and save lost people. The kind of people no one else would seek after. To be lost. This is a theme in Luke's Gospel. The kind of people that Jesus spends time with. It's those people out on the margins. People that get labeled as lost by a lot of other folks. And so Luke records in chapter 15 three stories. The first is the lost sheep. It's the story of a sheep that does what sheep do and it wanders off and it gets lost and it doesn't know how to get back to the pen. Doesn't know how to get back to the rest of the sheep. And it's out there somewhere. And the shepherd doesn't just say, Well, you know, I got 99 other sheep. It's only one. Just let it go because I'm tired. The shepherd says, That's one sheep that's lost, and I'm going to go find it and I'm going to bring it back. And so the shepherd seeks in order to save that which was lost. And notice that story picks him up gently and puts him on his shoulders and brings him back. He doesn't beat him with a stick all the way back, right? Keep that in mind when you're working with people. The second is the lost coin. This woman has this very, very valuable coin to her. It is in her possession, but she loses it. She tears the house apart because she can't find it and it's so valuable to her that she does not want to be without it. But notice the coin can't say, I'm here, I'm here. It doesn't know how to find its way back. And so this woman tears the house apart until she finds it and brings it back into her possession and she is full of joy. Because she sought and she found what was lost. And also what belonged to her. And she brought it back in to her embrace. And then finally, the lost son. It's possible for animals to get lost. It's possible for objects to get lost, even valuable ones but it's also possible for people to get lost and need finding. And so Luke records this story from Jesus about a young guy who was lost before he ever left his father's house. And he wanders off to try and find better life, to try to find more joy, to try to find something that he felt he was missing because it's got to be better out there than it is in my father's house. That's what everybody else tells me. And so he sets off on this journey to try to find life. And he wakes up one day and realizes that what he found was not life at all. He realized that life, the good life, was actually in his father's house. The place he had left. And he was in pain. And he was broken by this point. And he said, I'm going to go back to my father's house because it was so much better there. 
And you wonder, what about the father this whole time? What was he up to? He was watching the road every single day, waiting for the time when his son would wake up and say, where have I been? And start walking home. It's like he's got the binoculars on and he's just waiting for the sight of him. And then he does something that men in his day, grown men would never do, especially distinguished ones like him. He picked up his robe and he ran down the road. He runs down the road, sees his son, dirty and filthy and broken as he is, and he embraces him. And then he says to everyone who's listening by, this is my son, who was lost and now is found. The father's heart was seeking his son every day. He was gone. And he brought him back in to his embrace, into the family. And the lost became found. David says in Psalm 119, I have strayed like a lost sheep. We all do sometimes, don't we? We have moments when we stray. We have moments when we veer off the road a little bit. Sometimes we we did not mean to, but we find ourselves in a place that we never intended to be. And we realize this is not the place to be. This is not where life is found. What do you do in those moments? David gives us a clue. He says to God, seek your servant. He is pleading with God, I'm in a lost way right now and I need you to come and search for me. Seek me for the purpose of saving me. Because I can't save myself. This is the Jesus who was wrapped up in those claws in that manger. This is why He came to earth. He is the seeking, saving God on a mission to find and rescue lost people. John says it ever so slightly differently, but he helps answer this question for us as well. And I know this is a text that is so used within Christendom, but I never get tired of it, and so I'm going to share it with us again today, because it really does help answer this question of why. Why did Jesus come? John chapter 3, verse 16, for God so loved, just pause right there, God so loved Not God was so upset. Not that God was so angry. But God so loved the world that He gave the gift of His Son. His one and only Son that whoever believes in Him should not perish but have eternal life. The Son of Man came into the world to seek and to save lost people. 17 of chapter 3 says it this way, For God did not send His Son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through Him, through this little baby lying in a feeding trough that would grow up into a man And live and die for you and me and this entire world of people. Past, present, and future. He came seeking to save. This is what's wrapped up in this gift that we celebrate at this time of year. This little baby. God's gift to us. Two messages that come out of our time. God is actively seeking lost people not to condemn, but to save. That is 
one of the messages of Christmas. And number two, the gift of Jesus is the expression of God's heart of love for the human race. It was love that motivated him to come, seeking to save us because we were in a lost way. To bring us back into our Father's house, into our Father's embrace. Because He wasn't about to leave us on our own. We've mentioned that there are seasons in our lives where we find ourselves maybe a little lost at times. Maybe you just happen to be in one of those seasons right now. God is actively seeking you. His heart is towards you. He is searching, seeking to bring you back into a place of health and wholeness. And most of us know people at this season, we know people in general, who are wandering through life in a way that we would probably characterize as a little bit lost. God is actively seeking to save and for them to be found. And God is inviting you and I, as we experience this seeking God who saves and who finds us, He is inviting us to join Him in His work of seeking people, to connect them to the one who saves, who finds lost folks and brings them home. And so this Christmas, as we celebrate this beautiful season, let's celebrate the fact that God has found us and that God continues to find us when we wander. And then let's give ourselves to God's purposes to help Him in His work and join Him in His work, if you will, of seeking other people who need to be found by God. Because that's why Jesus came. Let's pray. Father, thank you. Thank you for not leaving us on our own. Not abandoning us to our own fate. But being willing to send your Son into this cold, dark world at great expense and at great risk so that we might be found and that we might be saved, both now and for eternity. Thank you for this gift. And there are people we know, God, that have not yet experienced the fullness of this gift yet. We ask that we might be agents to cooperate with you in your work of seeking and then connecting them with you, with you, with the one who saves. And maybe most importantly, let our lives reflect you so that when we tell them about you, they'll be drawn to you. This is our prayer for we ask it in the name of our Savior Jesus. Amen.